Radio Richard. Welcome, John Thurkle. I would call you Johnny, but I have so much respect for you. I feel that John is more respectful, don't you think? Uh, either way, I've been called much worse. So, so both of those are well within EEC guidelines, I think. Right, I, th I think that's good. And also, from the point of view of the Northern contingent, I think it's nice. Yeah. yeah, why not? It is, yeah, it's yeah. good. There are so many uh, special things about you. You've had an incredible career. You've done <coughs> kinds of things that are marvelous. But I want to start out with just talking about um, your very, very first gig. Good Lord. Good Lord. You didn't expect that, did you? <laughs> no, I didn't. No. <laughs> you do realize I'm very old, Richard, don't you? And, that, and my first ever gig was a long time ago. You mean, are you talking about sort of paid or professional or semi-professional? Or... You know, as you know, this is Richard Niles here. The, the only gig I'm talking about is paid. That's a real gig. <laughs> where, where money's changed hands. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, my, uh, my first sort of paid gig was at the rather illustriously named Airsome and District Coit and Rifle Club, <laughs> which is in Middlesbrough, which and, uh, I, don't, I, mean, I don't know how many of the listeners, stroke viewers have been to Middlesbrough, but, <coughs> but um, it, it's, you know, it's a beautiful place, um, or right. was, or was right. once upon a time. Right, anyway. and, what, and what did you get paid? Um, I think somewhere in the region of about six quid or seven pounds or something like nice, that. Not, nice. not very much. It was with a band called the Max Deal Half Dozen, um, which rather enigmatically there were eight people in. But there I knew that was going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was. It's just a working man's club. And, well, and you know, it was. It was a Max Deal. That was the kind of deal it was. It was a Max Deal, so you got eight for six. Oof. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just read something to my listeners and just this is your your Wikipedia entry. And I just think this one sentence, I I don't want to go through all the thousands of people that you've worked with, but I am going to read this one sentence because it's quite an incredible sentence. Through the 1980s and early 1990s, he was on at least one album in the UK charts continuously without a break for over 13 years. In 2019, he had two consecutive UK number one singles and was the first person to be inducted into the Musicians Union Hall of Fame. In 2020, he scored his 25th number one playing on BTS Dynamite. I mean, that's a that's quite a sentence to have in Wikipedia, isn't it? Look, what what intrigues me, Richard, is who writes this stuff. That's the that is the uh, it's, it's it's fantastic because actually I just copied verbatim that from Wikipedia and put it on my website. It's, right. But but um, yeah, look, I, I it's funny enough because I knew I was doing this today, Rich. I you know as you know, you and I have been friends for a long time, longer than we care to remember. Not long enough. Indeed, indeed. Well, we'll we're working on that. Yes. Um, but of those 20, so I just looked up the, the sort of information, and of those 25 UK and US number one records, 20% of them were for you. Wow. ABC. Um, uh, 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 Best Life, Boys Zone. Yeah. Pet absolutely. Shop Boys, Share. Yeah, Pet Shop Boys. Yeah, <clears throat> all of those. Yeah, they were all... Um, yeah, so thank you, Richard. I, I, have a, I have an opportunity, finally, 30-some years later, to uh, publicly thank you for your patronage through the well, years. Thank you, yes. Well, I, 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 I can only say that the pleasure was all mine, and uh, any session with John Thurkle on it goes better. If that's uh, you know, they really were, I mean, they were they really were the most marvellous days, ladies and gentlemen. There were, it was, it was a, a there were heady times, Richard, weren't they, in those back then, you know, it was, it seemed like, uh, you know, I'm in the middle of writing a sort of memoir, uh, yes. largely for my grandchildren, I'm not sure whether anybody yes. else would be interested yes. in it. Yes, But, um, you know, looking through my diary, 
you know, there, there was, it was mad. There was just so much going on. Like in one week, you know, you've got Pet Shop Boys, Monday morning, Monday afternoon, Frankie goes to Hollywood, Tuesday rehearsal for the Prince's Trust at Wembley. It was just crazy. I, I mean, I, I, I sound like, sorry, I caught myself being or sounding boastful there. I don't mean to be boastful, but I, I, what I'm trying to illustrate is that the difference, the stark difference between the, the, the London studio scene then in the 80s yes. and 90s and, and now, I mean, now it's quite an event for people yes. to, to, to have a exactly. session. Exactly, exactly. I mean, I, I was doing a session every day, every week, uh, yeah. you know, in those days. And, uh, and as you say, sometimes they were, you know, 10 to 1, 2 to 5, 6 to 9, yeah. And, and and then tend to forever if you were working with somebody like Trevor Horn or somebody like that uh, who would, who would yes. go on all night. Um, yeah. yeah, Trevor Horn. Well, but just for the benefit of your listeners, Richard, yeah. uh, I mean, I'm sure I don't know how clued in they are, but there was a period I would say for probably at least ten years where, in London, if you were making a pop record and you needed brass and strings and it didn't have Richard Niles arranging it, then he was either on holiday or you couldn't afford him. That was pretty much the top part of it. Everybody. Right. Used or, or you might have gotten, I mean, there were a couple other people who were doing a, a, a fine, marvelous, upstanding job. But uh, as long as they were brave, they would hire Richard Niles. You know, as long as they, they had a sense of humor and, <laughs> and wanted something uh, that was fun. Then yeah. they would hire me, yes. And and uh, but you know the thing that I think also is interesting about those days is the fact that today, I mean, I did a session uh, a week and a half ago, my first uh, string session for a couple of years, and uh, it was quite an incredible event. You know, I was in Village Recorders in L.A., a fantastic studio, mm -hmm. and everyone felt like it was Christmas time because there was an actual session of musicians playing together. Wow. You know, and, and, and me standing there conducting them, you know, I thought, wow, I remember how to do this, you know, uh, yeah. but it used to be a constant, a constant thing. And um, the difference between you and a lot of other musicians though, is this, and maybe it's to do with the Northern thing, or maybe it's just to do with the way that you were brought up. You were, very on top of the business side in terms of how it worked, you know, filling out the forms, keeping the paperwork. You know, unfortunately, I was not, as you well know, because you've helped me with some of this, mm. I was not on top of that at all. I was just wrapped up in the doing of it and yeah. all the other stuff. And uh, I've learned about this uh, doctrine that a lot of people, it's not just me, but a lot of people didn't get paid for uh, in those days for a lot of their early work uh, in terms of the royalties that musicians get for performance royalties. But mm -hmm. there's actually a doctrine in law that says that if you take too long to claim for something, you can't claim for it, which is a terribly unfair uh, mm -hmm. doctrine or of law. But because not everybody is actually a lawyer and not everyone has a business person, especially if you're a working musician. So anyway, I don't know why I'm talking about that except to moan a bit. But uh, but I'm I'm very interested in you talking a little bit about the fact that you were, you also started a very, very successful business or two while you were being a working musician. Can you talk a little bit about those things? Yeah, I, I, I sort of, you know, I was always aware of the, of this, you know, the tenuous nature of being a, a you know, being a musician, you know, it's, there's, it's, it's right, you know, being a musician's dinosaur shaped, isn't it? You know what I mean? It's, it's thin at one end and at both ends and thick in the middle sort of thing. And yeah. sooner or later, you're going to get to the tail part. <clears throat> yes. So I was always conscious, really, that there needs to be something else than I'm you know, that, that I've got up my sleeve, as it were. And so uh, my, a part, my friend and I, we, we were asked to record some music for somebody, you know, there was a kind of a, uh, just a, a sort of sound like uh, kind of an album of popular tunes sort of thing. We recorded that and we, you know, he asked, can we do another one, another one? And eventually we'd done a lot of these and it's, it occurred to me that actually there's some value in this. 
And so to cut a long story short, you, you know, instead of instead of being paid sort of selling those tracks, we, uh, we decided to, to, we would license them. So we would keep ownership of the, uh, of the, of the, the, the copyright and the master and we would license it to people. And then next thing we know, we, we own about 20,000 masters, which, which we, <laughs> um, which we then licensed and we started representing other people's stuff. And it, it sort of accidentally, transmogrified into a, into a business which which was really super fortunate and we set up labels and um you know all around the world i'm sorry my phone keeps ringing um we set up labels all around the 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 uh, uh, the world we partnered with various people anyway and, and then but how, the interesting thing for me is of course it's beautiful that you did all this but how the hell did you know how to do that i i wouldn't have known i mean i knew how to make pancakes but I wouldn't have known how to do that. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean, I, I I'm an interested sort of a bloke. Do you know what I mean? I I, I um I, uh, it drives my wife nuts because I you know I just like to know how everything works, whether it's the coffee machine or whether it is you know the business side of music. I'm just interested in how things work. I'm an inquisitive sort of mind, and it doesn't take very long to work out who's making the money in these sort in these sort of transactions, you know. Um, the, the 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 guys making the actual music, generally speaking, aren't the people making the money. So I thought, well, okay, I need to try and put a foot in that camp, you know. And so, and it, it's, I mean, the, the great thing about that is, I think you can do it. You know, there's a general perception that. It's us and them, you know, and the guys, the, the label people are ripping everybody off and the musicians are getting, it, that, it doesn't have to be like that. I mean, I'm sure it, it is like that in some instances, but generally speaking, I think, you know, we have tried to, to um, you know, to be as honorable and as, you know, straightforward as we can. And, and I think we are, we're musicians too. So, so um, yeah, and over the years we've built that into a business and, I, and there's, I don't know. We've got something like seven thousand albums on iTunes, or something like that, something around that, and that's sort of my pension, Richard. You know? Yes, indeed. I'm sure it is, and that's and and I'm very happy about that. Yeah. Uh, that now the other side, of course, is that you were not just a studio musician; you were a really incredibly successful studio musician. I'd like you to tell me all of the qualities that a really successful studio musician needs to have. It, it, look, being, I, I think anyway, being a good player, that's just your entry ticket, okay? That's just the, the you, you, that gets you through the door. I think beyond that, it, it's about so much more than, you've got to be able to deliver the goods, of course, but Richard, you've seen yourself. I mean, I've seen guys sitting on a session and the session's not even over and they're writing out their invoice, you know, and that always, you know, I'm sorry, it's generally usually string players, but, um, and that's always struck me as just, I think, well, just do the job. I mean, at least, at least finish the job first, you know, before you start thinking about charging. And I, I think you've got to remember that you, uh, it doesn't matter what the music is, it doesn't matter whether you like the music or you don't like the music, that's not the point. You're not there to like it or dislike it. Okay, you're, like, you're there to provide what the producer or the arranger wants. And I, I always use this analogy. Um, you, you know, if you're walking up the street with, with a pram, okay, and if somebody came up to you, uh, and, I mean, if you look in the pram, you wouldn't say, geez, that's an ugly baby. No, um, it's not. You just wouldn't. But um, what you have to remember is when you when I when you turn up to do a session, that's somebody's baby. They've be, they've put their heart and their soul and everything they have into it's that, that. and you have to treat that with the respect that it deserves. And right. I think so many musicians don't do that. They see it as a job. Right? Mm -hmm. If I wanted a job, I'd get a much more regular paid job, you know, than being a, a musician. A better paid job, yes. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. so 
So I think, you you know, that is an important thing. You know, you, you have to treat people's music with the respect that it that it deserves, whether you like the music or not. Indeed. And and I mean, part of, part of that is, of course, the, a lot of the uh, people that I interviewed, uh, especially the people who worked as arrangers, uh, talked about the necessity of diplomacy. Uh, mm -hmm. You've got to be able to have, I think, for me, a, a, an a, ability to suss out the personalities that you're working with. If you know that you're working for, you know, a, a, a brandy swilling, coke sniffing producer who's going to be flying around uh, in a manner which is not conducive to getting practical work done, then you have to think of some way as a musician to get the work done and to figure out what part of the personality that you're dealing with you can do to concentrate his mind on the work. I mean, there's a, there's some people are, I mean, I, I, I did a session once with Roger Daltrey, I remember, and, and uh, I was so excited to meet him. And for the entire session, he was sitting uh, in the back of the studio, reading literally a comic book um, and as, as surly and depressed and, and, non-responsive as possible so mm. and and i was obviously trying to communicate with him in some way to say are you happy with what's going on and i don't know you know he might have had some terrible news that morning and i just you know i knew that that's the time to back off you know mm -hmm. and i just got on with the job did it the producer said thank you and that was the end of it but you know some people would be not clever yeah. enough to... and you've got to read the room for read sure room. Yeah, yeah definitely yeah. And, and I think also, Richard, uh, uh, being an affable sort of a guy, you know, I mean, you know, people love working with Richard Niles because he's a little bit wacky and a bit and a bit sort of weird. And you know what I mean? And, and he's great fun. And, and, and I think <laughs> that's that, that's not unimportant, isn't it? You know what I mean? I think don't be a dick is the is the is the watchword. You know, I think. Yes, be a Richard. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Be a Richard. <laughs> For, you know, I think I because I get you know getting along with people is an important yes an important uh, thing. People like to work with people that they like. Yes, uh, that's right. I've always I think these are the indiscernible to, to to sort of get back to your question. <clears throat> these are the sort of indiscernible things which I think make the difference. Right. Like I say, being able to do the job it just gets you through the door. Beyond that, it's about it's about the way in which you operate um, uh, and, you know, the respect that you give the job and, 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 and the fact, you know, we, you and I know, Richard, remember those are early Swing Out Sister sessions. I mean, Breakout was a different one because that, that was, that was a sort of, I, you didn't fix that. I think, I think somebody else fixed it, but it was myself and, and Gary Barnacle and Luke Tunney and Peter Tom. So that wasn't, yeah. but the, the, the other sessions for the album, for the other tracks on the album, there yeah. were three drummers, weren't there? There was Guy Barker, myself, and John Barkley, I think. Right. Now, of those three, I, you know, I'm not the best trumpet player out of those three people. But I asked myself, why, how, why was it me that went on to do the touring with the band? And, and I think it's because I get along with people. You know, there's cracking a joke. There's a, you know, a wise crack and that sort of stuff. Absolutely. But it's more than that because um, it's kind of, I was talking to Snake about this uh, just now. It's more than that because it's not just being likable and affable. It's that when somebody is with John Thurkle, or indeed a, a few other people that we could name. You know that you're with somebody who's, who wants to make everything right, who wants, who really doesn't bring their ego. You know, Quincy Jones has this cliche, he says, about leaving your ego at the door. I mm -hmm. think it's very, you don't leave your personality at the door, you leave your ego at the door. Mm -hmm. And it's realizing that you're doing something to to make somebody else feel yeah. good and look good and and feel secure so they know that john thurkel knows how to do that they know that if they hire john thurkel they've got somebody who's got their back who's going to support them a hundred percent uh whereas if they if you get somebody who's perhaps like some of the other people you could name uh there's a there's a tood an attitude that is going to be you know it's about them but it isn't about them yeah 
Yeah. And even though I bring a hell of a lot of personality to a session, I also am hoping that they will dig what I've written. And if they don't, fine, I'll change it. Bang. Done. Mm -hmm. Cut out, cut out bar 32. I went too crazy. Okay. <laughs> no, surely not. Richard. Surely not. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was, I mean, that was always the thing, you know, you knew when you were, when you get up in the morning and you've got a, a Richard Nile session at 10 o'clock, you better get up early and do an extra bit of warming up. Cause... That's what everybody has said to me throughout the years. And even oh, I was am amazed that when I used to work with, uh, with Gavin Wright's string section, which was mm -hmm. just, you know, a magnificently wonderful experience. Yeah. Um, all the musicians used to say, oh, you know, yours are the only string sessions that we practice before we come in, because we know that we're going to be seeing, if you'll excuse the expression, fly shit. Uh, <laughs> and we better we better have our chops up. And yeah. and, you know, Gavin would always hire people, the people who could cut it. Because he said, if you're afraid of, you know, some 30 second notes, you better not come to this session. Uh, not to, which is not to say that I always wrote 30 second notes, but, but you better be prepared, man. <laughs> uh, well, any... I, think, I think it's it's more a fear of the unknown than anything else. You know, you yes, just, you know what you're going to get. You, know, you could be. Exactly. Could be I mean, it's always going to be musical. We know that. But it might be musical in a in a crazy bebop sort of. Um, Sick manner. Way. Yes. So let me just now you that you've mentioned the word bebop, I just want to briefly say something that, you know, I've told a lot of people about this, and they really don't know it about you, that you played jazz chair in the Buddy Rich band. I want you to just, I mean, that's just such a, that's like being told, uh, could you just climb Everest, please? Yeah, thanks. Every night. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about being on that band and, and because the stories about, you know, Buddy Rich is pretty heavy stories. So tell me sure. something. <laughs> yeah, well, look, it, it was, <clears throat> I'm not really sure how that happened. I had a sort of a period of, of jazz, big bandy sort of stuff. And I'm, it's not my particular bag. I, I'm not really sure how I, how that happened. But I happened, yeah, I mean, it was completely by accident. I was playing Ronnie's with um, Gil Evans. And the, the day before, Buddy had sacked his, the, the trumpet player on the jazz chair. And, um, a couple of the guys from his band were came into Ronnie's, saw me play. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time and, and, and got offered the job. And, and it was it was terrifying, Richard, in, in every sense of the word. Um, no rehearsal. So do you, do you want to do the band? Yes. OK, we, we start tomorrow. First gig is tomorrow. No rehearsal, a book about this thick, but it doesn't really matter. There's no point in looking at it because, you know, he just call a tune, whatever tune comes to, to mind. Yes. And so you better have your reading chops there uh, because, that, trust me, Buddy Rich Band is, is not a band where you want to be making mistakes. Oh, no. Nah. And so... Um, he was legendary uh, for his cutting comments. Did you hear any choice ones while you were there? Yeah. I mean, there, there, yeah, I did. Yeah. I mean, I, look, I think um, he... he he would throw drumsticks from time to time. Yeah, I, mean, I, I dodged a drumstick or two. Nice. Uh, he was, I, I think I got away lucky, because, and I'm not sure why, whether <clears throat> because I was English or whether because I was just, you know, a sort of temporary six-week fill-in or something like that. But I, I never felt the the full wrath of his tongue. I, I, there, were, there were plenty of group bollockings, as it were, to use a technical term. Yes. But... um. But uh, I never personally got got hair, uh, hair drying. Um, but yeah, look, I mean, he he was a, a guy who demanded absolute respect and demanded um, that people do things his way. There are two ways, his way and the wrong way. Right, um, exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah, there's a pretty, pretty you know, I, I hesitate to... I, you yeah. know, I hesitate to go into... There are some pretty grim stories, but... But... Having said that, it was an incredible experience. Something I'll, something I'll, I'll, you know, I'll always sort sort of cherish. You know, yes, yes. Uh, in a, in a in a sort of I'm glad that's over sort of a way. Can you tell the people a little bit about uh, doing the Uptown Funk record? 
because everybody knows that record and it's young Johnny on, on trumpet. So what, tell me. Yeah, a little but, about I mean, there is some contention on that. I, I know. Yeah. Okay. So I, I got, um, I got a call from Dave Bishop, uh, you know, a mutual friend of ours, thanks Dave, to say, could I do a session on such and such a date for Mark Ronson? Fine. So I turn up and the deal was that he'd recorded this, the horns on Uptown Funk already he'd done them in, in, in New York with a, with a, a horn section in New York. Wasn't quite happy with them. Didn't, it didn't sit right. So we re-recorded those, um, you know, he just quickly played it to us and I transcribed it very quickly. And then, and then we, we blew through it. And so, um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, it, thereafter followed some sort of back and forth where, where we claim we did it, they claim they did it. In the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. You know, I suspect that it's an amalgam of both, but. Uh, but in the, in that, uh, in that he said that they didn't sit right, there must have been something you noticed about what he noticed that wasn't right. So not really. Not, I mean, you know what? I, do you remember? I mean, you, you and I both worked with Trevor Horn a lot. Okay? Sure, sure. Incredible talent. Really, I mean, a great guy too. A very, as much lovely guy. But yeah. he can be obsessive about tiny little minuscule things, can't he? Exactly. And I think I, I think Mark Ronson is the same. You know, yeah. there was something, it actually sounded fine to me. And, and <clears> what <throat> we recorded thereafter, you know, I didn't, we didn't A, B them, but uh, but it didn't feel any better or, or worse than the than what was already down. But there was something in there which, which, uh, which Mark, you know, rather like, uh, uh, rather like, um, you know, he's something which he, I don't know, it's something he yeah. heard. Which I didn't hear. Well, there, but there was also already a like a synth part doubling the brass, was there not? I um. Yeah, it I sounds guess. to me sounds to me on the record when I listen to the record that it sounds like a brass section, but it also mm -hmm. sounds like underneath it there's this buzzy little synth underneath. Now that may have been the processing that he get put on the brass. I don't know. Yeah, it, could, it could be. Yeah. It may have been the other brass section. We, I mean, we don't know. Nobody knows and in, you know in sort of typical fashion yeah it's lost when you ask the question I, I don't really know either they'll have used a take from here and a take from there and a bit of this and a bit of that and blah blah mm. so so um yeah but but it was it's, uh, it's a great record to have on your cv that's for sure one of the things that i have done and certainly in throughout my career but but a little bit more in in later life uh, is try to impart the uh, wisdom of experience on the younger generation. And uh, one of the things that you're doing is the elite music camps, which I think is a fantastic idea. I'm fortunate enough to, to um, find myself owning a, 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 an old farmhouse in, the, in the, the, the Sierra Nevada mountains in southern Spain. It's a, it's a lovely spot. It's, it, you know, it's sort of my... <laughs> exit plan if you like you know that was going to be my it, it, or it will be my uh, uh, you know retirement place yes in about 50 years yeah oh yes indeed it's, I mean, and it's a big old place you know there's sort of seven bedrooms and lots of room and a bit of land and what have you and uh, it was actually snake davis and i who who, who you know snake is a great snake is a great teacher he really is a great teacher you know he's just got this you know, you know how Zen Snake is, you know, and he's just, he sort of passes that on, really. He's really good. And, and so we came up with this idea of taking a bunch of students out there, four saxes, four trumpets, and just having a week of sort of master classy type stuff, right. you know. Right. Wow, right. And we, so we did that and it was very successful. And anyway, cut a long story short, um, you know, I formed Elite Music Camps and we now run a bass camp with Paul Turner, the bass player of Jamiroquai, um, uh, Rob Harris, the, the, the guitarist from Jamiroquai, we do a guitar camp, we do the, the horn camps, we do some drum camps, and, and it's, it, this is sort of, I mean, it's a fantastic way, way to, to earn a living, really. Um, you know, I'm getting up, up, you know, I'm getting to the point age-wise where traipsing around Europe on a bus, whilst it's great fun, you know, is gets harder work every year. Every time sure. you do it, it gets harder and harder. Sure. So for me, the, the, this, the ability to, to spend a week in my own home, sleeping in my own bed in the sunshine, 
and I've made some incredible friends. You know, the students, what's great for, I think for the students is they come and we all live together in the house. So that whatever questions they've got, you know, that comes up at breakfast or, you know, uh, you know, we, we might be swimming or, or, you know, it's, 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 it's a, a week of just full on the, the tutors, whether it's myself or Snake or Paul or Rob, we're available all day long and we hang out and we have some, drink some wine and eat some food. And it's, it's really lovely. And, and I think it's, it, it's, um, you know, when you teach somebody, when you give somebody a one hour lesson, you know, you, it's hard, isn't it, Richard? You know, because you're going to cram in as much as you can and then they go away and they forget it. And that, that, that. Yeah. But living together for a week, um, you know, you're able to reinforce all of those things and you can, you can afford to, to sort of approach your teaching in a much more rounded way, you know, rather yeah. than just trying to absolutely pile a bunch of information on them. You can sit together and, and work it all out. It's really, really lovely. It's really yeah. lovely. Well, that, that's fantastic. And uh, uh, the audience has seen all the links uh, that they can go to if they're interested in that. Yeah. Uh, be living in Europe, which I hope I have lots of European fans of Radio Richard. But, hey. uh, but meanwhile, um, I, I'm going to ask you a couple other just funny little questions. First of all, what was the funniest thing that ever happened to you on a, on a session or a gig? And I'm not funny, but you know, Rich, I know you've done over the years. You've done lots of um, of uh, um, you know jingles, advertising jingles, and that sort of stuff. Hell yes. I, I've always found that to be the most ridiculous. Uh, sort of branch of studio playing ever. I mean, it's populated by fools and 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 madmen. Um, and there's a couple of in, couple of. I remember once. I shan't mention any names. That wouldn't really be fair. But 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 it's, these are people I know you will have worked with. And and it's a studio, a jingle studio, right off of Oxford Street, right on Oxford. Anyway, Ad Vision. No, no, no. Um, so um, if I say the name of the studio, then, then we, oh yeah, okay, okay, okay fine. I, I'll, 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 uh, I'll respect your anonymity. Indeed, yeah, Chris, he's a lovely guy. He's a lovely guy, really. I see. But very, very successful. Drives a Porsche. You know, done lots of really high-profile right. uh, advertising stuff. I mean, you know, proper and done really, really well. Made lots and lots of money out of this business. And anyway, I get a phone call one day and said, "Hey, John, can you come down to the studio uh, like as soon as possible? I've got a, I've got this uh, jingle. We're almost finished, and I just need to add some trumpet." So sure, I'll come down there. I can be down there in half an hour. So I, I, I whiz down to the studio and I get in there, and he said, "Okay, so here's our, um, here's our track. Played me the track, and he said, this is the sound I'm getting. I want you to get. I want you to." You, replicate as close as you can to this sound and then he played me a, a, another track another record and i listened to it and i said no I, I can't i can't get that sound and he said now come on do we go so no really i can't I, I i just can't and he said look you've done dozens and dozens of jingles for me every time you've given me exactly what you want what do you mean you can't do it i, I don't believe it i said i'm telling you i can't get that sound and he said, why not? I said, it's a saxophone. Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, I mean, Rich, you, I mean, you're familiar, I'm sure you've got, I'm sure you have a load of stories. The oh, other one was Benson and Hedges. Do you, do you remember Benson and Hedges cigarettes? Oh, sure. So they were in a, gold, a golden packet, right? And so I was at Kick Studios, uh, which was on Greek Street there, friends of mine. And, and, and um, uh, I was booked to, to, to play on a jingle for... Benson Hedges this is back in the days when you could advertise cigarettes on TV. Um, and it was literally four notes, very short little thing, literally four notes on the trumpet. So, oh, sure, okay, fine. So we run the tape and I play the four notes and, and um, you know, the, the engineer says, okay, great, sounds great. The, the advertising guy, you know, the, the with the ponytail, you know, those guys. Yes. Um, yeah. The ad guy says to me, no, 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 hang on a second. No, I'm, yeah. There's just something not quite right about it. Okay, well, what do you think? I, said, I can't put my finger on it. I'm not really sure, but just some, I'm not sure. Can you try something different? So I'll try on the flugel. So I played it on the flugel. No, not right. mm -hmm. Okay, back to the trumpet. I put the cup mute. No, no. Tin mute. No. Four notes. We were there for about an hour playing the four notes over and over. And then all of a sudden, um, uh, um, 
you know, the wise, the, the, the wise and sage advertising guy says, I've got it. I know what it is. It's, you, have you, it's not golden enough. So, because I, at the time I was playing my silver plated um, gets, <laughs> it's not golden enough. Have you got a golden trumpet? And I said, well, Yeah, I have, yeah. But I mean, it's at home. He said, How long will you take to get it? Well, <laughs> a couple of hours or whatever. <laughs> Honestly, Richard. And so I sat there in the studio with the meter running, my meter, the studio's meter, all those meters running while they sent a motorbike out to my house to pick up a, 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 a tr another trumpet. I brought it back, you know, the, the bike brought it back. I've got it out of the box. I play the four notes and Einstein says, perfect. That's exactly it. I played it exactly the same way as the first exactly. time I played yeah. it three hours previously. Well, you know, John, because you've told that story, I'm going to tell you my story. Okay, good. Because, you know, because it's, it's in the same area. I once did a jingle where they wanted always look on the bright side of life, but they couldn't afford to buy it from the Monty F Python people. Mm. And so I, I, I knew that Mitch Dalton had played guitar on, on the original. And of course, I, I'm quite a guy when it comes to um, transcribing stuff. Indeed you are. Yes. I mean, I, I can transcribe pretty damn well. So I transcribed the exact thing. Plus, I got a guy who was a friend of mine named John Savannah, who does Eric Idle so uncannily perfectly. He used to do it, you know, as a party piece, just for fun. Just, and he's like, oh, why you say? But, you know, he it sounded exactly like him. He had it perfect. So <clears throat> now I had it. And then Mitch told me who played on the original. So I had all the same guys and mm -hmm. that there they were and it was perfect then you know and i had a great engineer and he listened to the original a beat it a we a beat it it was exactly the same as the original record yeah so we gave it to this woman who was the advertising executive she says hmm, that's just not like it at all and i said what she said well you know it's similar but quite frankly, you were recommended as somebody who was, you know, pretty professional. And this is, this is just not right. I said, well, look, let me have a, maybe it's the mix. Let me, let me have another go at it and I'll do that. So I did another mix and we really, you know, we went for it seriously. We spent about three hours in the studio getting, and it was a short, it was just the, the opening yeah. part of it. So gave it back to her. No, this is this is terrible. This is nothing like it. And the singer, she said, the singer sounds like it sounds like some, you know. And she made, she just said no. So then we went back, and I I said I'll do it again. Now this is all costing me money, sure. Because she says I'm not paying another penny for this. You know, I I hired you as a professional, right? So then we did it again, and seriously, we we a beat both tracks. To, I mean, he did spectrum analyzation of the of the EQs and of all the stuff that I don't understand. Uh, and we finally got to the thing where it was absolutely perfect. And she said, no, I, I just I just won't say and I'm not paying you anything. And, and I've had enough. This is, you know, I'll, I'll never work with you again. And I'm telling everyone never to work with you because this is terrible. So I said, OK, I'll tell you what. Give me one more go, just one more chance. So I went in the studio, I edited the original. I took the original master tapes of the original. Okay. And 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 edited the seg segment that she wanted and yeah. I gave it to her. Yeah. And she said, well, I suppose this is usable, but it's still not right. <laughs> so that's my story. I had to tell you because she told me that story. Yeah, look, I mean, it's it is. Um, I, I'm in that. Uh, you know, I've got a lot, a lot of friends in that world, and f I know a lot of them have to put up with that stuff in a on a daily basis. And I say, you know, for me, there's not enough money in the world to. Yeah. to and and you know, there. I think you'll agree. There are occasional guys who 
who you work with, with who are advertising guys who really know what they're talking about. And when they when they don't like something, they give you a reason. And when they do like, you know, they'll give you a really clear brief. There was a guy called Dave Trott, who's also a great writer and a brilliant guy. Very, very clever. Do you, did you ever work with him? No, I don't think so. His name is oh, you missed out. He, he's a great guy to work with. And he really knew what he was saying and what he was doing. And uh, there are guys like that, but man, I would say 99% of them, it's just a joke. Like we just told some jokes. We just told some jokes, yeah. yeah. There we are. <laughs> the funniest thing. Um, I'm trying to think of one that, that that's, I, could, I could actually tell. The story. <laughs> the matter, one. If they're clean, I'm sure you, I mean, if they're not clean, you can clean it up. Yeah, okay. Well, maybe, okay. First one that springs to mind is, I don't really remember a producer called Ian Levine. Yeah. So Ian Levine was the sort of, uh, the big kind of northern soul producer in, in the right. UK. Right. And, and you know, Ian liked his food. You know, he, he, was, a, he was a big lad, Ian. Um, and he would sit all through the session eating chocolate. And, and anyway, Ian's dog had a chow, a big dog. And... Um, we're in the booth and we're playing away and Ian's sitting there eating his bars of chocolate and, and he's giving the dog chocolates and all, you know, he was the last thing he's supposed to do with the dog. Um, and all of a sudden I see Ian and the, the, the engineer, they leapt up from their seat and ran out of the studio in the horror. Like, what's happened? What's happened? The dog had taken a shit onto the, onto the, under the sound desk, I mean, <laughs> fed chocolate, of course. So there was a disastrous occurrence from, from the dog. Um, and I, I've never seen a room clear so quickly. Yeah. And you said, I'm not sure. Think... Yeah. There we are. I don't know. And you said, I didn't Richard, think it played that badly. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I know some longer stories, but, but the, yeah. Well, that's, that's certainly a, an aromatic one. Okay, indeed. Yes. Um, if you want to end in a longer story, then I can I can do that now. Sure. Well, sure. If you yeah, if, if you've got another story that's fun for the people. <clears throat> I was in the Red BBC Radio Big Band. Um, and it was Paul Morgan's birthday. Fine bass player, upright steam bass player, and we did the morning session. We go to the afternoon session. We go to the tennis club and most of the guys get absolutely battered. It's Paul's birthday. So they arrive back for the afternoon session 10 minutes late, okay? And it's a guest conductor, a guest conductor who, uh, I shan't name any names, but um, his, the music he chose was, was, I guess the guys felt it was beneath the BBC Radio Big Band. It was things like Little Brown Jug and kind of Glenn Miller music. And so there was a lot of contention there. Um, and uh, uh, you know, a lot of groaning and moaning and, 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 and anyway, eventually, uh, so we do Little Brown Jug and we play the thing. And then the last chord, he puts a substitute chord, a different chord. One of the trumpet players, not me, stand up and said, uh, I've got a wrong note on the last chord. And, and ah. the, the sky, Johnny says, uh, uh, no, no, it's, I've just, I've changed the chord. And he said, no, it sound, it's, it's definitely got a wrong note. He said, what have you got? No, no, that's the right note. I've just changed the chord, but it's wrong. No, it's not wrong. Right? I'm the arranger, it's my arrangement, and I've changed the last chord. He said, well, it's wrong. No, I'm the arranger. Okay. Anyway, so the whole thing starts to kick off. This particular trumpet player stood up and gets the music and tears it into little shreds like this. <laughs> They've been to the pub, right? They've spent two hours in the pub. Um, they tear the music to shreds, throw it on the floor, and it all kicks off. The producer comes in, there's lots of shouting, and, and you can't, you know, you can't blah, blah, blah. And the, the conductor said, look, so it's all well and good you complaining about that. I wouldn't mind if you were playing it properly, but Harp, you know, you, you can't even play the you, the, the bomb, 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 that starts at the beginning. You couldn't even get that together. Half of you are so pissed you couldn't even get that together. 
So the drummer said, okay, you can't come in here and say that. You can't come in here accusing people of being pissed. That's, that's outrageous. You can't do that. Uh, come on, who is it? I said, well, I, you know, no, come on. You come in here saying people, who is pissed? Name, who is it? And so the conductor just turned and looked at Paul, who was fast asleep, sl slumped up for his face, <laughs> snoring away in the middle of all of this stuff. <laughs> Very funny. Yeah, anyway. well, that's fantastic. Um, don't behave like that on sessions, kids. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, you know, I don't even want to talk about the number of times that I, as an arranger, have had the producer saying, wait a minute, there's, there's a wrong note everywhere. <laughs> and I said, Anyway, but we won't get into that. What I do want to do is, um, John, old chap, would you like to play something for us today? This is this is a carbon fiber bell trumpet. So the, the, the bell is made of carbon fiber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's made um, of... it's it's called it's a da carbo. They're all hand built. Very few of them, I believe, um, um, Arturo Sandoval has one. I think. Right. I believe, and also um, a couple of other players whose names I can't remember. Yeah, but yeah. They, they, they're quite rare, anyway. And this, the the, the, um, uh, the guys there at Dakabo very kindly sent this across to me. Um, you know, despite me, Richard, as you know, I played the same trumpet my entire career. Indeed, my my nineteen sixty two Getson. I played this Indeed. my whole career. That's the one I've seen. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I saw, you know, I, I wasn't really in the market for changing, but those kind guys um, at Takabo sent me this, and I, I've grown to love it. I really like it. It's a lovely yeah. sound. Good. Well, so, um, let, yeah. let, whip it out, big boy. I'm going to play a lovely little tune. This is a tune, Richard, that I've always loved, and I think it's a massively underrated tune. And I think that's because it comes from a wobbly little, funny little. Um, sort of novelty film, um, Annie Get Your Gun, I think it is, or something. Nice. It's, it's a tune called Secret Love, which is... Oh, sung beautiful. The, yeah, I mean, it's a, a lovely tune. Anyway, beautiful. I shall now proceed to mash it to pieces. Thank you. Wonderful, John. And, you know, I might be tempted afterwards to add a little soft chords behind you. Yeah, why not? Yeah, baby. Yeah, please do. Yeah. So, so John, thanks so much for today. Um, it, this is going to be a real special uh, episode of 
Radio Richard, and uh, I'm I'm really excited to uh, have people hear this and uh, enjoy it on their times when they're walking the dog and when they're driving to their uh, dentist and all of yeah. those things. And congratulations, by the way, on your um, on your dizzy heights in the charts. There, it's fantastic. yes, I know, I know. It's it's uh, it's completely amazing to me. I'm happy about it, and I I know that I have this great content. But I'm I'm just shocked. You know, I, it's funny. I I guess I shouldn't be, but I'm surprised when anything I do is successful. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 kind of you know. I, luckily, I have this great guy Hugo Caro, who's an Argentinian guy who who helps me with with the technical side of the website. And and uh, you know, for some reason, we're doing something right. So um, please subscribe and uh, all of that stuff. So, John. Thanks so much, and uh, I look forward to uh, doing all kinds of squishy things with you soon. Sure. As soon as we can travel, Richard, I, I'll either come to LA you, or you come to London. We'll make a plan. We do something. If you come here, I'm setting up gigs all over the country. Awesome. I count me in. Fantastic. All Richard, right. Richard, great to talk to you as ever. Um, and yeah, we'll speak in a bit. We will. Thank you. Over and out. Hey, lover. Thinking of getting up close and intimate with your loved one tonight for a bit of romantic fooling around? Forget it, because I'm Richard Niles, and instead of playing Lady Penelope and the Butler, you could be under the covers listening to my podcast, Radio Richard, intriguing interviews and procreating performances from master musicians like Bob James, Lawrence Juber, Michael Brecker, or Leo Sayer. Hey. If you're not shagged out after that, there's always time for a little bit of uh, fun and games afterwards. Don't miss a moment of the fun. Subscribe to Radio Richard.